You complete me. What is a rom-com? Ooh, good question. Oh gosh, what does make for a good rom-com? What is it that I'm missing? A rom-com is essentially any movie in which the couple probably hook up at the end and you're rooting for them the entire way through. Go get her. All right, all right. It has a dash of romance, a dash of comedy, hence rom-com. Easy math. Ooh, but ooh, look who knows so much. I think romantic comedies are sort of wish fulfillments in a lot of ways and people like watching them because it's this idea that everything can work out perfectly at the end, no matter how terribly they start from. The will they, won't they aspect has to be good. We are just going to be friends, okay? There has to be fun twists and turns, and there has to be a killer line. You had me at hello. I think a memorable rom-com boils down to one thing, and that's chemistry between the two leads. This is true love. We were looking for really memorable scenes. We were looking for timeless moments in these films. It was surprisingly difficult to narrow down this list. We wanted the best moments, but we also wanted to show the breadth of the genre. Oh, do you? Yeah. Well, that's funny. Why is that funny? That makes sense. Play. In the end, I'm sure there'll be one or two films that people love that didn't make it on this list, but I promise it's an excellent list you'll want to refer to forever. Don't be nervous. Your favorite might not be on it, my favorite might not be on it, but no matter what you think, this is a great list. These movies are 10 of the greatest romantic comedies of all time. What the hell was that? I'm showing you the magic! Excellent. All right, this is great. Show me the money! I'm waiting! Action! Five on the set. Mrs. Robinson, you're trying to seduce me. <laughs> the Graduate was one of the most popular films of 1967, earning seven Oscar nominations and launching the career of 30-year-old Dustin Hoffman. I think The Graduate, I, I think it'll remain a classic forever. It sort of changed everything, the tone, the way it sounded, the Simon and Garfunkel soundtrack. And yes to you, Mrs. Robinson. Uh, Graduate, I think, is actually one of the best movies of all time. It's uh, just a great romantic comedy, great movie, directed by Mike Nichols. What are you going to do now? I was going to go upstairs for a minute. Oh, I meant with your future. Dustin Hoffman as Benjamin Braddock, who graduates from college and really has no idea what he wants to do with his life. Just one word. Yes, sir. Are you listening? Yes, I am. Plastics. Benjamin kind of captures the wayward post-college guy of that era. I mean, he he comes home, he, you know, he's back with his family. He's aimless, he's kind of wandering around, and then he stumbles upon these relationships. Eventually, Benjamin falls for Elaine Robinson, played by 27-year-old Catherine Ross. Hello. This was her biggest role. She's also known for her work in Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, but this is probably the best known role of hers. So Elaine is sort of like this very good girl, very sunny California, sort of perfect girlfriend material. Would you like to come in? I could make you some coffee. But before dating Elaine, Benjamin has an affair with her mother, Mrs. Robinson. My husband will be back quite late. He should be gone for several hours. Oh my God. And Bancroft starred in the iconic role. Would you like me to seduce you? What? Is that what you're trying to tell me? The 36-year-old actress had already won an Oscar for The Miracle Worker. W-A-T-E-R, water. It has a name. It's the first time we'd seen that trope sort of in cinema of this older woman seducing this sort of young, hapless boy. Have you gotten us a room yet? I haven't, no. Do you want to? Well, I don't. I mean, I could. Or we could just talk. But what's so great about The Graduate is it's not creepy the way that she's doing it. She's just sort of badass. Why don't you get it? Why well, don't I get it? Well, I will then if you'll excuse me. Miss Robinson is also pretty evil and kind of like tries to keep him away from Elaine. In order to keep Elaine away from you, I am prepared to tell her everything. Benjamin's relationship with Elaine is ruined after her mother blows up everything, tells her daughter that She's been sleeping with him. Goodbye, Benjamin. So then Elaine goes off and finds like another nice person to marry. So the scene that made our countdown from The Graduate is Benjamin's big rush to get to Elaine before she's married off. One of the best scenes, uh, you know, in The Graduate, certainly and one of the most iconic scenes I would say ever is when, you know, Elaine is going to get married and Benjamin kind of runs in. <laughs> he is slamming on the glass and going, Elaine, Elaine. 
it's probably the most iconic scene of a wedding interruptus. Speak now or forever hold your peace, and clearly he doesn't. <laughs> Nobody wants them to be together, but he, you know, does this big gesture, and it's the scene that'll have you at the edge of your seat, and you're really rooting for them. <laughs> And then he kind of like frees Elaine from this terrible marriage that she's going to be in. He symbolically locks all the adults in the church with like a cross. Benjamin gets Elaine and they're running off together and they're on the bus and there's this big rush of excitement like, I can't believe we did this, we're running off together. And then the camera holds and you just watch their faces drop and they realize that, you know, okay, now this is real life. That's not only a memorable scene, but it's a memorable shot because seeing both of their smiles just slip away in that moment uh, is, uh, is kind of crushing because you know that that is what life is like. The ambiguous ending. It was really the first sort of movie with a love story that did that. Within the sound of silence. The Princess Bride premiered in 1987 and soon became one of the most beloved and quotable rom-coms of all time. As you wish. Inconceivable! A fun storm in the castle! The Princess Bride was kind of a satirical sort of parody of, you know, fantasy films about a hero, you know, storming castles and saving the princess. Um, it put a little twist on it because the dialogue is hilarious. Yeah, that's smart. Let me put it this way. Have you ever heard of Plato, Aristotle? Socrates, yes, morons. It's just a great kind of like swashbuckling romance with like, you know, incredible lines, incredible comedy, a lot of great, you know, very vibrant supporting characters from Billy Crystal to Andre the Giant to Mandy Patinkin. My name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. It is, in the end, though, a love story uh, between a princess and her farm boy. Farm boy, polish my horse's saddle. I want to see my face shining in it by morning. As you wish. Princess Buttercup was played by 21-year-old Robin Wright in the role that launched her career. She's got a pretty good resume. You know, she starts with Princess Bride, and then you have Forrest Gump, and then House of Cards where she's playing this sort of Lady Macbeth. Completely, three completely different characters. Shame on you, Mr. President. 25-year-old Carrie Elwes starred as Wesley, the farm boy turned hero. Rest well. Dream of large women. He's so dry and so witty. Then there's that gorgeous, symmetrical face and that crazy little mustache. You seem a decent fellow. I hate to kill you. You seem a decent fellow. I hate to die. He did do a pretty great sort of spoof on himself in Mel Brooks' Men in Tights, and I always enjoy an actor who knows how to mock himself. Good people who have traveled from villages near and far, lend me your ears. That's disgusting. So Wesley and Buttercup's story starts when Wesley is the farm boy and Buttercup is slightly above him in class and Wesley must go off to make his fortune before he can be with her. We end up with uh, Buttercup being held captive by the prince and Wesley dying, being brought back to life and coming to rescue her. Why won't my arms move? You've been mostly dead all day. So the scene that we chose for The Princess Bride is, as he's slowly regaining control of his limbs, he has to face off with Prince Hepperdick in the castle. To the death. No. To the pain. I don't think I'm quite familiar with that phrase. Wesley has just been revived from the dead and is very weak, but Prince Hepperdick doesn't know this, and Wesley uses a mind game instead to, to beat him at his own game. To the pain means the first thing you lose will be your feet below the ankles, then your hands at the wrists, next your nose. Wesley goes on in excruciating detail about what to the pain means. And then my tongue, I suppose. I killed you too quickly the last time, a mistake I don't mean to duplicate tonight. I wasn't finished. The next thing you lose will be your left eye, followed by your right. He goes through all these, this litany of terrible things he's gonna do to Chris Sarandon's character. And then my ears, I understand. Let's get on with it. Wrong! Your ears you keep, and I'll tell you why. So that every shriek of every child at seeing your hideousness will be yours to cherish. That is what the pain means. It means I leave you in anguish, wallowing in freakish misery forever. I think you're bluffing. 
So he bluffs and he uses basically every iota of strength that he has to pretend that he can stand up and fight him. Drunk your sword. And it's through this way that he's able to win ultimately. In that case, mm -hmm. help him. Why does Wesley need helping? Because he has no strength. It's a great piece of physical comedy, I think, from Carrie Elwes, who plays Wesley. It's, it's a really great sequence. I knew you were bluffing. I knew he was bluffing. The thing about The Princess Bride is it's as funny now as it was in 1987. Kids love it. Adults love it. Adults who remember being kids love it. It's just the legacy lives on and on. I feel like this is a movie that people watch over and over again. None of it is dated. It doesn't, it doesn't feel cliche in any way. It still feels sort of new and different, and it's still really, really funny. Oh. Oh. Wow. What? His whole face is like a Picasso. Oh! You're a perfectly adequate grading card writer. That was actually my nickname in college. They called me Perfectly Adequate Hanson. In 2009, audiences fell in love with 500 Days of Summer, a quirky indie film about modern day romance. He used to call me anal girl. I was very neat and organized. Former child star Joseph Gordon-Levitt starred as Tom, the hopeless romantic. Joseph Gordon-Levitt, a kid actor, you know, maybe you've seen him in Third Rock from the Sun. Or oh, in Jehovah's name, poked my souffle! <laughs> He kind of really never had like an adult performance, I don't think, until 500 Days of Summer. He really is a romantic lean and, you know, kind of like catapulted him to future roles in like, you know, The Dark Knight Rises and, you know, Inception and all these big movies. 500 Days of Summer really was a kind of a breakout performance. I've run out of ways to say congrats. How about every day you make me proud, but today you get a card. Shit, that's good. I know. His character works for a greeting card company, and every day he's writing slogans about love. And so he has this skewed uh, fantasy about what love really is, whereas Summer doesn't quite see it that way. There's no such thing as love, it's fantasy. Well, I think you're wrong. Summer was played by Zoe Deschanel two years before landing the lead in the hit sitcom New Girl. I accidentally saw Nick's pee, -pee and his bubbles. But it's not a big deal. Ain't no thing. Ain't no thing. This is really like a breakout kind of quintessential role for her. She's the quirky young woman who you kind of want to fall in love with, but maybe she doesn't want to fall in love with you and kind of like really plays to her strengths as being very funny, very romantic, kind of aloof and like really smart. Come on, I love Ringo Starr. Nobody loves Ringo Starr. That's what I love about him. 500 Days of Summer follows their romance from the very beginning. They sort of fall in love at work. So that was fun the other night. Across the 500 days of their relationship, you see how they get together, but then she falls out of love with him, and it chronicles this up and down turbulent relationship. Aren't you happy? You're happy? You're not? All we do is argue. That is bullshit. The scene that we chose from the movie to feature is the expectations versus reality split screen scene. He believed that this time his expectations would align with reality. Now this happens after Tom and Summer have already been broken up, but they run into each other uh, after many, many months at a coworker's wedding. I was gonna maybe have a party on Friday. And at the end of the wedding, she invites him to her party on her rooftop. He goes into this party thinking that this is going to be their big reconciliation moment. They're going to get back together. Your time. Hey. How are you doing? Good, how are you? Good. You know, we kind of split screen and see what his expectations are for the party, which is getting there and she's so excited to see him and, you know, they're going to just hang out and talk and really kind of connect. On the other side of the screen, you see what actually happens. She greets him like a friend. Yeah. Yeah. That's, the... That's so nice. Wow. Thank you so much. She doesn't talk to him the whole night. Everyone, I think, has lived through this, whether it was a crush or a relationship that didn't work out, but it's so universal. The pivotal moment in that scene is when reality just completely takes over visually, and you just know that that's kind of the representation of Tom's mind. He still had a little inkling of, of expectations. He still thought maybe that's possible, and this is him seeing her with her engagement ring, and that just pushes out all of his fantasy. That's it.
He's crushed. He knows that he can't have her back, and he leaves dismayed and disgruntled, and, you know, all of his expectations come crashing down. The expectations versus reality scene is the one day that most represents what the movie is about, which is the huge gap between what you expect and what you want and sometimes what you get in life. You're married. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy, huh? It's such an untraditional ending to a romantic comedy, but you have the two of them on this bench. It is a reunion, but there's no future for the two of them together. I just kept thinking, Tom was right. No. <laughs> yeah, I did. It just wasn't me that you were right about. That's just a great line, and that really summarizes the whole relationship. That he saw her as a fantasy, as expectations the whole time. Summer, I really do hope that you're happy. Hello, Harold. Can I give you a lift? The 1971 cult classic Harold and Maude is one of the most unconventional rom-coms of all time. It's about a romance between an 18-year-old suicidal schoolboy and an 80-year-old woman who's a Holocaust survivor. I like you, Ma. Hmm. I like you, Harold. I love this movie. Harold and Maude, I think, was actually a total flop when it came out, critically and commercially. Nobody was into it. All right, then we'll be off. And then it took about 10 years before it became a real sort of cult phenomenon. 74-year-old Ruth Gordon starred as Maude two years after winning the Oscar for her performance in Rosemary's Baby. No! It can't be! Oh, look at his hands. Ruth Gordon playing Maude as a 79-year-old, really kind of how we all want to be. When we are closing in on 80, she's this like free spirit. She does her own thing. She doesn't really take guff from anybody. Harold was played by 23-year-old Bud Court in what remains the biggest role of his career. Bud Court uh, had been in a few Robert Altman movies before Harold and Maude and uh, Rooster McCloud being one of them. I don't think I could do it without your help. I'll always be here to help you, Brewster. Harold is kind of this despondent team, lost in the world, loves imagining his own demise, usually as a suicide. He keeps staging these fake suicides to the point where they don't even phase his mother. Harold's other morbid obsession is attending funerals. Turns out he's not alone. Harold and Maude both find funerals fascinating, and when they see each other, they kind of like, kind of pick out that they're maybe funeral tourists and they have something in common, and that kind of like starts up their relationship. The setup of Harold and Maude is sort of crazy in retrospect, but the, the whole point is that they really, they fall in love. I think Harold and Maude is really a story of two outcasts who meet in the middle because they're fundamentally completely different personalities. And they're both too weird to be friends with anybody else, so it's perfect. I should like to change into a sunflower, most of all. They're so tall and simple. The scene we picked from Harold and Maude is really an interesting one. It begins in this flower patch where Harold and Maude are sitting and talking about what kind of flowers they're be. What flower would you like to be? I don't know. One of these, maybe? Why do you say that? Because they're all alike. They're sitting in a field of daisies, and she hits him with this wisdom. Oh, but they're not. Look, see, some are smaller, some are fatter. It's a really nice statement about individuality and loving yourself and, and the value of sort of understanding that everyone's different. Much of the world's sorrow comes from people who are this. Yeah. Allow themselves to be treated as that. There's this great Cat Stevens song playing. He does all the music for the film. And then they pan out to the cemetery, you know, so you have these little white flowers and then these these acres of white tombstones and, and you know, I think you can probably get the metaphor. It's not, like, too hard. It's just an amazing moment and really kind of, like, sticks with you when you think of Harold and Maude. And so you have these two people come together and really form this unlikely bond. And while it may not make sense to anyone around them because of the age difference, Emotionally, it, it's completely logical. You're very beautiful. You know, the heart wants what it wants, maybe, is like a great kind of phrase to say about Harold and Maude. You make me feel like a schoolgirl. This is hilarious, smart, 
heartfelt movie. It's just super weird also, which I love. Any man has a chance to sweep any woman off her feet. Just needs the right broom. In 2005, Will Smith won over audiences as Hitch, a professional date doctor who helps insecure men land the women of their dreams. Listen to what she is saying and respond. Hitch is a classic rom-com really because it's just a complete star vehicle for Will Smith. He's got so much charisma and he really had never really done that kind of like full-on rom-com before and I think this really plays into a lot of his strengths of, you know, comedy and, and romance and he's just like a very suave kind of guy. Bam. Wow. How do I look? Fabulous. Ava Mendez starred as Sarah, a gossip columnist who becomes Hitch's love interest. Relationships are for people that are just waiting for something better to come along. Ah, uh, spoken like a true cynic. The 29-year-old actress was fresh off her role opposite Matt Damon and Greg Kinnear in the comedy Stuck on You. Oh my God, I'm an actor too. Oh yeah? She's just a really great actress, kind of like very feisty, very fun, really had a good, you know, repartee with Will Smith. Aren't you a sight for sore eyes? I believe this belongs to you. Mm -hmm. The hallmark of any great romantic comedy is the meet cute between its two stars, and you know, Hitch has a great one. You know, they meet at a bar. She's kind of getting hit on by this really sleazy guy. Couldn't help but notice she look a lot like my next girlfriend. And Will Smith comes over, he pretends he's with her to get rid of the guy. Sorry I'm late, honey. I couldn't get a cab. Uh, how was the meeting? He basically pulls out the full arsenal of all the tricks he's learned as a love doctor. It's a pleasure to have met you, Sarah Milas. And then he walks away because I guess every good love doctor knows you have to leave them wanting more. Bye. Bye-bye. But after meeting his own dream girl, Hitch suddenly loses his game which plays out over a hilarious first date. When he meets his match in Ava Mendez, he just completely goes, stumbles all over everything. I saw that going differently in my mind. There's a scene where Hitch goes on a date with Sarah and Sarah's boss and Sarah's boss's wife, and they're doing this sort of cooking thing. You any good in the kitchen? Well, I can stand the heat if that's what you mean. Good. Hitch and Sarah go to a, a cooking class together and they're gonna like kind of like, you know, get together and make some exotic things. They're they're handing around appetizers and a conquille Saint Jacques with a lemon oh. butter reduction. Which he doesn't recognize as a scallop. Right away he starts sort of getting a little out of it. Hey, is it itchy in here or is it just me? And he's thinking it's nerves because he doesn't he feels insecure about this date and he's in front of her boss. Oh, I know what's happening. You think that I'm in a stressful state because I'm trying to avoid all these awkward conversations. <clears throat> no, I, I, I think you have food allergies. But it turns out that it's a full-blown anaphylactic reaction to seafood. Oh. 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 Wow. What? cut to the drugstore and you know he sees himself in the mirror and his whole face is just exploded basically. His whole face is like a Picasso. Oh! Completely, completely thrown off of his game because this is like the smoothest guy in the business and he's a wreck. Basically guzzling Benadryl in a drugstore aisle. Come on! Will Smith takes the allergy medication, kind of gets all high and drunk off of that. Mm. I bet this would be great on the rock. Mm. You go back to Ava Mendez's apartment, it's like a really sweet moment. So how do you feel? Good. Relaxed. Basically all his defenses are down and she's taking care of him. And they have kind of their first genuine moment together when they're not kind of circling and performing for each other. One moment you're gliding along. Next moment you're standing in the rain watching your life fall apart. And then we cut to the next morning and they have their first kiss outside of her apartment. And it's really passionate, really sweet. The allergic reaction scene is really this kind of pivotal moment where things get real. It is the thing that brings them together. Give me a ring. Sometime. I mean, on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, uh, definitely will the massive allergic reaction on a date. It's a really good way to break down barriers. It's a good, I recommend it for a second date. He realizes through the flight that he's on the same plane. You guys gotta help me. Right! Yeah! yeah!
You're the wedding singer. Yeah. How you doing? I'm Robbie. I'm Julia. In 1998, The Wedding Singer marked the first of three rom-com pairings for Drew Barrymore and Adam Sandler. I'm actually waitressing at your wedding next week. Cool. That's a beautiful ring you have there. Are you getting married soon? Despite the film's late 90s release, the story takes place in the 80s. Hey, do you like Flock of Seagulls? I can see you do. The movie is just a lot of fun and has, because of all the 80s references, I feel like the nostalgia level is very high. Please get out of my Van Halen t-shirt before you jinx the band and they break up. It's a really sweet film. It was a big departure for Adam Sandler at the time, who was maybe known more for, you know, Happy Gilmore and Billy Madison. Hey, look everybody, Billy peed his pants. Of course I peed my pants. Everybody my age pees their pants. It's the coolest. 31-year-old Sandler starred as Robbie, a wedding singer whose fiance leaves him at the altar. Perhaps we should call her. I don't need more time, Robbie. I don't ever want to marry you. Once again, things that could have been brought to my attention yesterday! He showed a side of himself that you maybe hadn't seen before, a little softer, a little nicer, a little bit more romantic, and you totally bought it. What's up? That new waitress, that's what's up. 22-year-old Barrymore played Julia, a server at the banquet hall where Robbie sings. May I have this dance? Great role for her. She's just so lovable. I think it's hard not to look at Drew Barrymore on screen and want to not, like, just give her a hug. She's so, you know, sweet and nice, and this film is really, you know, kind of like peak Drew Barrymore. She had obviously been a child actor before and had worked since then, but this was a really turning point where she be kind of became a rom-com staple. Okay, well, thank you for the tip. So yeah, there's some conflict because she, because Drew Barrymore's character is engaged to someone else, and Robbie, Adam Sandler's character, has just been recently heartbroken. That was so cold. You must have felt like shit. No, it felt really good. Thanks for bringing it up, man. You know, my parents died when I was 10. Would you like to talk about that? But as the movie progresses, they clearly have a lot of chemistry and start falling in love and aren't really sure what to do about it. You two look truly happy. You're gonna make it. I know, believe me. <laughs> kind of like wondering, will they or won't they, up until almost the very end. So the scene we chose from The Wedding Singer is this classic moment where Robbie is in a mad dash to fly to Vegas and stop Julia from marrying Glenn. I don't know what to do. She's getting married and he's gonna ruin her life. Yeah. Glenn doesn't deserve her. Again, it's set in the 80s, so Billy Idol makes a random appearance. See, Billy Idol gets it. I don't know why she doesn't get it. And he realizes through the flight that he's on the same plane as Glenn and Julia. No way! You guys gotta help me. Right! You hear the PA come on and, she, and, and it's Adam Sandler and he's singing this song that he wrote. Since we let our first class passengers do pretty much whatever they want, here he is. It's very sweet and has all these like very tailored lyrics to their relationship. I'll get your medicine when your tummy aches. Build you a fire if the furnace breaks. So That's like Adam Sandler really bringing together a lot of things he does well, which is, you know, boyish charm with like his bad singing talent that ends up being really kind of sweet. I'll miss you, kiss you, give you my coat when you you know, Billy Idol's there to make sure that Julia's, you know, boyfriend doesn't get the best of Adam. Kind of like really throws up a, bu a bunch of screens to keep him away. Uh, how you doing, sir? Chicken or fish? You better get out of my way, Billy. You're going to get hurt. Oh, yeah. Don't you talk to Billy Idol that way. I, it's, it's just a really sweet, kind of great sequence at the end. And they kind of have this lovely romantic moment at the end where she's like, yeah, I'm, I'm all in. Forget this guy on the flight. Like, we'll take our own flight somewhere else. I'm in love with you. I am so in love with you. I think every woman dreams of having the grand gesture um, done for them. And this is probably the most grandest of gestures. You add in the song that he's written for her. You add in Billy right. Idol. You add in all the altitude, it's just like a perfect recipe for a great romantic scene. In 1996, Jerry Maguire scored big at the box office, raking in $270 million. Show me the money! The smash hit also earned five Oscar nominations, including a supporting actor win for Cuba Gooding Jr. You're loving me now, aren't you? 
think it's a great movie. It's a great romantic comedy. It's a great sports movie. It kind of like fills a bunch of buckets. 34-year-old Tom Cruise starred as Jerry, a sports agent at the top of his game. Hey, buddy. Until he's thrown into a tailspin. Came here to fire you, Jerry. He has this epiphany in the beginning of the film that maybe he shouldn't be such a, you know, con like a greedy type of agent. So he writes his mission statement and, uh, you know, kind of gets himself fired basically from his fancy agency. I'm not gonna do what you all think I'm gonna do, which is just flip out. Tom Cruise in the 90s, he was the biggest star in the world. And coming into Jerry Maguire, he was really kind of maybe more famous for his action roles. You know, the same year it was Mission Impossible. We're so used to seeing Tom Cruise, like sort of hot shot, risky business, you know, Top Gun kind of guy. And this is the first time he plays a failure. Who's coming with me besides Flipper here? I will go with you. Dorothy Boyd, thank you. 27-year-old Renee Zellweger played Dorothy, a single mom who joins Jerry to start a new agency. Her life is not that fun and she sees a chance to do something and be part of something amazing, maybe. And also because he's Tom Cruise. I just want to be inspired. Me too. Just a breakout role in every sense. She kind of came out of nowhere and then all of a sudden was one of the most famous actresses in the world. And, and her chemistry with Tom Cruise is really off the charts. <laughs> Jerry and Dorothy get together, but like all good rom-coms, there's a problem. Help me help you. Their brand new company has one client and no money. The big complication that we run into is that Dorothy is broke and she has a kid. Hi, Jerry. To fix her financial problems, she's going to take a job in a different city. But Jerry, in a last ditch effort to keep her around, proposes to her. What if we stay together? What if we got married? Will you marry me? He's used to being a fixer, so, so a, the proposal is a fixer thing to do. There's no romance in it at all. And she realizes that the proposal isn't what it should be. And she's strong enough to recognize that and tell him that. So this break is a break up. That's... Come on, Jerry. You know this isn't easy for me. Jerry flies to Arizona to support his only client. You did it. You did it. After an emotional night, Jerry finally realizes what he's missing. The movie is basically a bunch of Jerry Maguire has epiphany scenes, but this one he's like, oh, you know, I'm married to Dorothy. Uh, I really kind of maybe messing that up and I should not do that. I have to get my priorities in order. He realizes that she is the person he wants to be with. So he rushes home to tell her and she's in the middle of her older sister's divorced group of women, um, which is not the most accommodating group to walk in and profess your love to. Hello. I'm looking for my wife. This is where it has to happen, and this is where it has to happen. Jerry doesn't stop, he doesn't, he doesn't, he wants them to leave and then they don't, so he's like, okay, I'm just gonna lay it all out on the line. Our little project, our company, had a very big night. But it wasn't complete, it wasn't nearly close being in the same vicinity as complete because I couldn't share it with you. I mean, sure, he says a lot of things to her, but it's that one line. You complete me. You complete me, that captures it all. And she responds in the perfect way. Just shut up. <laughs> you had me at hello. You had me at hello. And so how, how else are you supposed to respond to this scene um, other than by crying? It's a lot for a movie to have one line that just kind of crosses over into the lexicon that everyone knows. This movie has two in one scene. I think that between You Complete Me and You Had Me at Hello, Jerry Maguire has, has managed to secure a, a firm spot in iconic rom-coms. I would never want to belong to any club that would have someone like me for a member. That's the key joke of my adult life in terms of my relationships with women. In 1977, Woody Allen wrote, directed, and starred in his seventh film, Annie Hall. Talk to him, you speak shellfish. <laughs> Before Annie Hall, Woody Allen was really kind of like very sticky. He had like, you know, did a bunch of slapstick movies like Bananas. 
I object, Your Honor. This trial is a travesty. It's a travesty of a mockery, of a sham, of a mockery, of a travesty, of two mockeries, of a sham. Well, Annie Hall is super funny, but it has a lot of serious undertones and kind of takes seriously their relationship. And it was like really kind of a step forward for Woody Allen for sure. And the Oscars noticed. Annie Hall won Best Picture, and Woody won for Best Director and Best Screenplay. Boy, if life were only like this. While 31-year-old Diane Keaton took home the Best Actress Oscar for playing the title role. Not getting my period, Jesus. Every time anything out of the ordinary happens, you think that I'm getting my period. A little, little later, I think one of them may have missed it. So at this point in her career, Diane Keaton had been kind of a vet of Woody Allen movies. She had a few under her belt. You always think of baseball players when you're making love? Keeps me going. Yeah, I couldn't figure out why you kept yelling slide. It's hard to believe that you haven't had sex for 200 years. 204 if you count my marriage. Soon we shall be covered by wheat. Wheat. I'm dead, they're talking about wheat. The moment we picked from Annie Hall, I think is really kind of emblematic of what makes that a classic movie in and of itself. It's the meet cute between Alvy and Annie. Who's playing with who here? Uh, you and me against them? They're playing tennis, and you know, Annie Hall's terrible. And afterwards, uh, they're kind of like chatting. You play very well. Oh yeah, so do you. Oh God, what a, what a dumb thing to say, right? I mean, you say it, you play well, and then right away, I have to say you play well. I think the whole awkward first meeting, the first beginning to get to know someone is, you know, a trope that you'll see in every romantic comedy. Oh well, <laughs> la-di-da, la-di-da, la-la, yeah. But this one really gets to the heart of a very specific kind of awkwardness. Which way are you going? Me? Um, downtown. Yeah, I'm, go I'm, I'm going uptown. Oh, well, you know, I'm going uptown too. No, wait a minute. You just said you were going downtown. Yeah, well, um, but I can... I'm oh. sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> they go driving through the city and it's shot in a really hilarious way. Driving a tad rapidly. Yeah, don't worry, I'm a very good driver. I'm She's in this little VW bug, just careening all over the city, cutting off trucks, and he's pretty sure he's gonna die. And this is like the most neurotic guy in the world. She's just terrible and like speeding through, and he's like very nervous, and then they park. I live over here. Oh my God, look, there's a parking space. That's okay, you, we, we can walk to the curb from here. Which is just... One of the greatest one-liners, I think. It's so funny. And then, you know, kind of they go back to her place and they're on the balcony looking out and they're kind of having this really inane conversation with each other. Did you do those photographs in there or what? Yeah, yeah, I sort of dabble around, you know. You see their first sort of awkward flirtation. They're, they're, they're wonderful, you know, they have a, they have a quality. Well, I, I, I would like to take a serious photography course. And the greatest thing that Woody Allen did was he included subtitles so that you could see what each half of the couple was thinking. Photography is interesting because, you know, it's a, it's a new art form and a, a set of aesthetic criteria have not emerged yet. Aesthetic criteria? You mean whether it's a good photo or not? It's that getting to know you thing which is so inevitably awkward. The, the medium enters in as a condition of the art form itself. You want to be cool, but not too cool, and sound smart, but not like you think they're smarter than them. Well, uh, to me, I, don't, I mean, it's, it's, it's all instinctive, you know? I mean, I just try to uh, feel it, you know? I try to get a sense of it and not think about it so much. They're both kind of trying to impress each other, and they're both thinking they're blowing it, and it's such a perfect first date. It's still, still, you need a set of aesthetic guidelines to put it in social perspective, I think. Well, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I guess I guess you must be sort of late, huh? I think if you ask most people, Annie Hall is probably at the top of the list for romantic comedies. It sort of sets the bar for the all-time great. It's Woody Allen, it's Diane Keaton, it's New York City in the 70s. Everything about it is sort of charming and wonderful. Do you love me? I mean, I, love is, is too weak a word for, for I, I love you. It's just very lovely dovey and kind of like really speaks to young love in a way that I think, you know, a lot of movies don't attempt. Give my heart and she gave me a penny. I've glimpsed our future and all I can say is go back. <laughs> In 1989, Cameron Crowe released his directorial debut, Say Anything, about a summer romance between two recent high school grads. So it's Lloyd and, um, uh, let's go out. You wanna go out? 
It feels very authentic to the high school experience. It's very romantic, very fun, very kind of like tortured adolescence, but like in a way that's very relatable, I think, to the audience. I'll go. You will? Excellent, all right, this is great. John Cusack starred as the offbeat aspiring kickboxer Lloyd Dobler. Gotta be honest with you, I'm not looking for that. I'm looking for something bigger, you know? I'm looking for a dare to be great situation. The 22 year old actor had already made a name for himself with a string of films, including The Sure Thing and Better Off Dead. Gee, I'm real sorry your mom blew up, Ricky. John Cusack as Lloyd Dobler, I feel like this probably is his most famous, you know, performance and role. I'll tell you a couple things about myself. I'm 19, I've been overseas for a couple semesters, now I'm back. I'm an athlete, so I rarely drink. Kickboxing, you ever heard of kickboxing, sport of the future? I can see by your face, no. My point is you can relax because your daughter will be safe with me for the next seven to eight hours, sir. He falls for the school's valedictorian, and it's kind of a star-crossed romance. They're seemingly from different sides of the tracks. Lloyd's love interest, Diane, is played by 18-year-old Ione Skye. Hi. At the time, best known for her role opposite Keanu Reeves in the cult classic River's Edge. So now we get married, right? No. Let's get stoned instead. Lloyd is just a really solid person, and you just believe that he loves Diane and will do anything for her. Watch out for that glass. Thanks. Their relationship has a lot of peaks and valleys, but one peak is when they have sex for the first time. It's in, in the backseat of Lloyd's car. Listen to the song. It's a really good song. It's very romantic. Peter Gabriel's In Your Eyes is playing. Are you shaking? No. It's just very lovely dovey and kind of like really speaks to young love in a way that I think, you know, a lot of movies don't attempt. It just kind of like rings true for any teenager who maybe has lost their virginity in the backseat of a car listening to Peter Gabriel. Unbelievable. This is nightmare. Diane, you owe it to yourself to get on that plane with no attachments, no strings, because after you get over there, things are going to change. So a staple of all rom-coms is the complication. and. Right towards the middle, we've got Diane's father who disapproves of Lloyd and convinces her to break up with him before she heads off to college. I think that we should spend some time apart. They break up in the car together. Uh, Diane kind of hands Lloyd a pen and says, like, you could write me. She gave me a pen. Gave my heart and she gave me a pen. So after they break up, Lloyd kind of decides to make a big sweeping romantic gesture to try to get Diane back. All my instincts. He decides that he's going to stand outside of her bedroom, hold up a boombox playing Ga Peter Gabriel's In Your Eyes as a callback to when they had sex for the first time. It's uh, very romantic, very um, swoon worthy. She's kind of in bed and like not looking out the window and then we go back to Lloyd and he's just standing there and totally defiant and not, will not back down and holds that boombox up over his head. It is one of the most, you know, quintessential images I think of the 80s. So the thing that makes this scene actually really heart-wrenching is that Diane won't even come to the window. She's just lying in bed. She won't even turn over. She's just not having it. Diane doesn't run out of bed and into his arms and that's the end of the movie. No, there's much more of a deeply complex emotional beat to it where she just stays in bed. And I think that's part of the reasons that the movie's such a classic. You really want the, the cathartic, you know, moment where they get back together and you have to wait. Hey, Lloyd, someone's here to see you. I love you. How many more times do I have to say it? One more time would be nice. You know, they get back together at the end and Lloyd decides he's going to go to London with Diane and the movie ends kind of on this somewhat ambiguous note where they're on the plane and just staring at the fast and seatbelt sign waiting for it to go off. Where's the day? It's coming. Because then they know their plane is okay. It's a nice way to end, a, I think, a romantic comedy because you never know what's going to happen. I came here tonight because when you realize you want to spend the rest of your life with somebody, you want the rest of your life to start as soon as possible. In 1989, a little film with a lot of theories about love charmed audiences across the country. I would say Harry Mantelli is the quintessential rom-com. It's very funny, it's very romantic, and has a lot of truths about relationships that I think are really fun. Men and women can't be friends because the sex part always gets in the way. Sally was played by 28-year-old Meg Ryan, fresh off a string of successful films, including Inner Space and The Presidio. Before When Harry Met Sally, she was maybe most famous for playing Goose's wife in Top Gun. Hey, Goose, you big stud! That's me, honey! Take me to bed or lose me forever!
Ever. This movie really kind of like played to her strengths where she's very sweet and very funny. It's just a great role for her. And I'm gonna be 40. <laughs> when? <laughs> Someday. In eight years. 41-year-old comedian Billy Crystal starred as Harry. Billy Crystal you wouldn't think of maybe as like a dashing romantic lead, not like a Hugh Grant or Cary Grant. He's just kind of like a very average looking person. He was famous for like, you know, SNL. Barbara, you look marvelous. <laughs> Absolutely marvelous, eh? You wouldn't necessarily put him and Meg Ryan together maybe if you were doing it by like eyesight, but when they're together, it just really pops. <clears throat> oh, hi, Sally. Sally, this is Harry Burns. Harry, this is Sally Albright. Nice to meet you. The story of Harry and Sally begins with a random road trip from Chicago to New York. Grape? No, I don't like to eat between meals. They do not like each other from the get-go. I'll roll down the window. Sally is very persnickety. Harry's kind of a little bit more casual and laid back. And those two dynamics do not get along well in this long, long car ride to New York City. Fast forward to several more years later, Harry and Sally end up meeting on this plane ride. You look like a normal person, but actually you are the angel of death. Harry and Sally run into each other again. This time it's at a bookstore. Hi, Harry. I thought it was you. He has just gotten a divorce. Sally is also fresh off of a breakup. They reunite and there kind of is something there. Um, because they're both sort of going through these ended relationships, they kind of bond. You know, the first time we met, I really didn't like you that much. I didn't like you. Yeah, you did. You were just so uptight then. These are two people who decide to be friends. That is the crux of this movie and why it's different from other rom-coms. You know, you may be the first attractive woman I have not wanted to sleep with in my entire life. That's wonderful, Harry. So the fake orgasm scene is our number one moment for so many reasons. I mean, even if you haven't seen When Harry Met Sally, you know the scene in, in Katz's Deli. Why are you getting so upset? This is not about you. Yes, it is. You are a human affront to all women, and I am a woman. Harry is being his usual cocky, obnoxious self, saying that he has scored with all these women, and by score, I mean has made them all uh, scream and shout and, you know, have the best orgasm of their lives. Most women at one time or another have faked it. Well, they haven't faked it with me. And Harry is very clear about the fact that women do not fake it with him. So Sally decides to maybe find out if he really knows for sure if women are faking it. Ooh. Oh. Ooh. Are you okay? Oh. Yeah, Sally starts very slowly and kind of like really builds into it. Ooh, oh God. And it becomes oh. more clear as she starts to vocalize a little bit more and her tone gets a little louder and a little bit more excited. Oh yeah, right there. That, oh, she's gonna show him. Yes, yes, yes! She kind of like starts slamming on the table and throwing her hair back and just really, really getting aggressively satisfied, let's say. Yes, yes, yes! Sally is so oh. uptight in this movie. Oh. So for her to have this moment of like almost release and having every eye turn yes. towards her, it actually feels yes. kind of out of character. Yes. But I think she's also that type of woman who, when she knows she's right, she wants you to know she's right. Oh. She convinces him without having to say a single word. I'll have what she's having. An immediate iconic one-liner and I'll have what she's having. People still say that now. The woman at the table next to them is actually played by Rob Reiner's mom, the director's mom, which is pretty adorable. It's just a hilarious sequence, very funny, and you know, I think one of the best ever, and certainly in this film. I think When Harry Met Sally is definitely the standard bearer of all romantic comedies. That is just like you, Harry. You say things like that and you make it impossible for me to hate you. And I hate you, Harry. <laughs> they don't make them like When Harry Met Sally anymore. I just, I love this movie. Three months later, we got married. And it only took three months. 12 years and three months.